Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry and I have been stung by bees nearly 50 times in my life. This chat features none other than the creator of Stratacut Animation, David Daniels. Now besides making really, 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 really weird and wacky and cool Stratacut stop motion animations, David is also a director, filmmaker, and the co-founder of Portland-based Bent Lab Studios. Over the years, he's done animation for Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Sesame Street, and MTV. And in our chat, David shares what Stratacut is, how he came up with it, how you can make it, and who's willing to pay for Stratacut animations. But first, this episode is sponsored by Hue, makers of colorful plug-and-play cameras for learning, work, and play. Originally designed for teachers, Hue cameras can also be used for creative activities such as capturing hand-drawn pencil tests and shooting behind-the-scenes footage, time-lapse videos, and stop-motion animation. Their cameras have flexible, posable necks, manual focus controls, and they're compatible with Dragon Frame, OBS, Twitch, Zoom, and many other camera apps. Visit HueHD.com to learn more and follow at Hue Cameras on social media for news, fun and giveaways, and of course, get 10% off any Hue product from HueHD.com with code 10TerryAIP. And I've included the details of this in the description of this chat, so please go check that out. And now, without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, David. How are you? Hi. Hi, Terry. Good. It's good to meet you. Of course, you as well. You know, uh, your work is uh, kind of very infamous for being so specific and doing uh, kind of a, a lot of zany, crazy things over the years. So I'm wondering, you know, not everybody knows what Stratacut is, which you kind of invented the term for. Can you give me an overview of this form of animation? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think of it as geometry animation and it's space over time. Uh, much of what's claymation, you know, claymation is a subset of stop motion and Stratocut is a subset of claymation, but it uniquely um, allows you to see a two-dimensional surface illusion on a three-dimensional block, and it's a mystery block. You can't really see what's going on inside it. So when you cut it much like a loaf of bread, all of these images and pre-programmed, I think of it as predetermined, pre-sculpted lines and, and uh, geometry distortions are laid into a clay block, which then when it's cut away, reveals uh, just amazing um, psychomorphic, uh, a look unique to itself, really, you know, sort of, you can kind of tell that's what it, how it was made. Um, yeah, is that a good person? Yeah, yeah, I love the word psychomorphic. I'm wondering, can you explain how you create such a, such a thing <laughs> from, yeah, because I've, I've, I've never attempted one myself, but I've watched a lot <laughs> of, uh, maybe I should at some point, but um, can you just explain how you create, you know, moving images and animation from yeah. a loaf of clay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Terry, I just want to say the Stratocut living in your head and in your mind right now, whatever that may be, is as interesting or more so than whatever you would actually make with it. I think the concept of trying to do it and understanding how it's done is where all the sweet, juicy, wow, weird jelly is. Yeah. And doing it teaches you a whole other set of experiences because um, you understand that we're all cohesively glued together. Every moment in time is cohesively glued together with every other moment in time. And that's a striking sort of four-dimensional metaphor yeah. for... Uh, a dimension that we can't see because humans never we're time blind we never had this need to have an understanding of continuity of our motion through space and so the art of showing these lo these loafs was described to me recently as sort of sac a, a sacrifice to i don't know the cosmic gods in the sense that you in order you have to destroy the Stratocut block in order to reveal its animation to complete to complete the art art of the whole thing you have yeah. to actually yeah hack it and kill it but it blow you know then it explodes it's sort of I think of it as a difference between potential energy and kinetic which means a static uh, clay sitting in a block once you've laid it in the right way it's sort of like a series of of layers 
shapes, uh, textures. I have videos on this, of course, but um, think of it as like food is a very good analogy. Only in food, uh, you don't want the sushi roll to be continuous. You want the sushi roll in food as you're cutting it up to change into very specific warpy blob, blobs or lines. And as you put that, your mind to the idea of making that illusion in the two-dimensional cutting, yeah. you've built a three-dimensional shape to do that, right? Yeah. You're thinking in time like a line flow. Think like a line flow. So if I want to be walking in that line flow, I'm imagining you know this sort of thing going on as I build it. Um, Gosh, I mean, have you ever, have you ever read Kurt Vonnegut? You're you're um, it's right. kind of reminding me. I forget what novel it is, but there's like aliens that are looking at humans, but they see us as like four dimensional beings uh, of the right. completion of our life. So they see this yeah. long person with like thousands and thousands of arms and legs as like one piece in time, versus like we just see you know cut cutouts of those times but it sounds you're kind of reminding me of the concept that he tried to explain in in uh oh gosh i wish i could remember which book it was but um right, no i i agree yeah that's an excellent example by the way uh and I, i'm glad you brought it up and i can't remember the name the specific i have it in my bookshelf yeah, the name I for could the just, alien <laughs> i could just find it right now but anyways also yeah. while you're talking have you ever thought of leaving like i i liked how you said you know you have to destroy this thing to see what's on the inside uh, and then animate yeah. it, I guess. Have you ever thought of like leaving a time capsule that that's, uh, you know, a hundred years from now can be finally Absolutely. cut to show the animation? I, <laughs> I come around to that more and more, you know, yeah. the, the, there's a real catharsis to seeing it explode after you build one. Um, and the demos, I've been doing demonstrations focused on different aspects of it this summer. Uh, it's all on Instagram, please. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. it's a good reason to go there and and look at Stratica. But um, I always want to cut it up because the as an audience, live audience, or as a in person audience, either way, is looking at it. They know they watched all of it happen, get, get built, and then they see the result. And so there's a culmination or a real sense of catharsis, which is just irresistible. But I'm going to get back to your point. I agree that you want to leave it as time capsules. You want to have it sit there for a thousand years uncut. You want to, you know, that is actually the conceptual art uh, nugget of the whole thing that, that, that um, a frozen conscious activity loaf <laughs> has, <laughs> has stuck itself into a shape <laughs> uh, that lives beyond any any of us for however long it wants to live, as long as it doesn't melt or get, you know, whatever destroyed. And at any point you can reveal it. And then the message in a bottle sort of comes out from whatever I had put into it or anybody puts into it to that, in, those people, that entity, the singularity of humans who are watching on the other side, yeah. as they open up these. Uh, I wonder, uh, I wonder if somebody's uh, listening. Uh, some poor, some poor listener is still not really understanding what a strata cut is. And we're saying frozen no, continuity I, I, loaf. Like, <laughs> so I'm wondering, can we just, you, you know, just look, uh, log in. Yeah, just look it up. If minutes. you don't know log what we're right talking here, about, look it up. Minutes, log in, look at it, come back. <laughs> You'll get it immediately. So, okay. Yeah. Maybe we can just go through your process because, you know, uh, yeah. with no typical animation, you know, stop motion, 2d, 3d, et cetera. Uh, yeah. even film, you know, 12 frames per second, 24 frames per second. But with Stratacut, how are you predicting actions uh, being made in the animation based on a time period? Like, are you measuring out like kind of, you know, 12 centimeters is is one second of, of uh, Stratacut. And within that, those 12 centimeters, you try to you try to like make a clay action is that like i i don't know can you yeah that's 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 roughly correct okay um, i'm just making this up on the spot so i'm glad i'm roughly no, correct uh, <laughs> the nitty-gritty of it though is you have to figure out the minimum distance you need to cut in order for it to peel off unified like you don't want to be cutting chop slice slice like a fillet where you're just taking pieces at a time if you can avoid it yeah. Because the irregularity of that cut will sort of look like a water shimmer or something. So 
having it be a single straight slice, you decide, hey, an eighth of an inch hmm. is a general b b ballpark, which is like three millimeters, three wow. or four. And you, as long as you can control the cut, then that's your unit of time. That's your unit of frame, your unit of measure, your exposure sheet, your decision as to what kind of shape programming you want exactly at that moment on the on the length sheet. The length sheet is flexible though, because if your strata cut's small, like about the size of a, I don't know, that. An egg. Um, you can cut a 12th of an inch. Okay. You can get down to two millimeters because you have enough control between the knife and your hands to wow. get more animation out of an inch. That, or it's, uh, it's not squishing the rest of the clay as you make every cut? Well, it's not a recut. I'm, I would, if you build it at like two inches by three inches, you're going to be able to get a 12th of an inch. Hmm. If you build it at like sort of postcard size or bigger, you're going to get a eighth of an inch. And if you build it really big, and there's times when I've gone to like a sheet of paper as a scale, wow. which is a huge amount of clay and very dense and heavy, I had to cut it with a guillotine, but that was a sixth of an inch, not, you know, it was even fatter. And the reason why it gets fatter is that um, you, uh, you want the night, the, in this case, a guillotine blade, a mechanical guillotine blade, you want that not to bend on the way down. You want it to make a single, you have to make it big enough of a cut that the imperfections of how it flows through the clay are not seen because each cut is actually a single item, right? It isn't filleting, it isn't scooping, it isn't just taking a sliver here and a sliver there. So um, a sixth of an inch though relates to your timing. How would you elast elasticate your shape geometry? Because if I build an animation at a sheet of paper size, I want that to move fairly slowly. And if I want to build an animation at a, um, you know, a, a business card size, uh, you could make the animation move much faster gotcha. because the length of the cut is changing the perception of how fast that motion is happening once you've programmed the clay into the into the block. Wow, I love all these technical details. Also, like, you know, just re-watching some of your stuff before this chat. Um, how do you predict, uh, the, how do you change the motion over time? Because, like, you're essentially covering up each frame with new clay. You can't, like, take that clay off and go, where did, where were the eyes? Where was the right. whatever? I remember uh, you have, like, a counting animation. You have the numbers, like, actually, like, twirling, like, right. in three dimensions right. with this, with the cuts. Like, how did you accomplish that well, knowing that you, you're only cutting you're cutting like a millimeter two, two or three millimeters each time uh you measure it out and as you're cutting you're marking it off like an exposure sheet and if you're slightly ahead like if you're cutting too too much you have to sort of go down to thinner slices and if you're cutting too little you have to go to thicker slices and you do it gently so you're just taking the literal eighth of an inch or three millimeter measurement on the side and you're trying to match it. And if you get a little ahead of it, you just go a little lighter. And if you get a little in front, you go a little, yeah. yeah. But th there, you had a lot of questions there wrapped up. Um, <laughs> how do you pre-visualize it? Uh, you lay it down on a sheet with the measurements and you have all of the uh, explosive and hit points in the music or in, this, in the audio track that you want to hit. And um, then it's given, in, in that case, like I think it was an eighth of an inch. It's given an eighth of an inch, and I just try to keep it at that rate, give or take a few. That particular piece, one to 40, Sesame Street, all the numbers changing and rotating, um, was about 40 feet long. Sorry, how many feet? Um, 40. 40 feet. Four, four, Where four do zero. you? Uh... <laughs> 35 meters. I don't know. Where do you I have space it? to make some uh, a 40 foot long clay loaf? You don't. Uh, you. you you build it in train cars, you know, yeah, it's like train cars sense. on a train track. And so you build one piece and another and another. And at the end of one train car, you create a dovetail joint or a sort of uh, uh, feathering that is designed ideally to tongue and groove right to the next train car, right? So you're attaching them, but you build it that way, but you take them off a shelf. And so every four feet or every six feet, whatever chunk of length you have on a board, you pull that down. And that's added to the previous train car before you can see the um, joining process. You 
you see a lot of what's extruded from from the yeah. log as it's being cut, but you don't see past maybe a foot, right? And so I would have to put another four feet on it behind off camera to make sure that you saw the whole 40 feet all at once just coming right at you. That makes a lot of sense. I've even seen... the, the, you had to invent because I only had a small garage. Yeah. And the camera also, for stop motion people, is tilted up like this. The plane of the uh, Stratocut is on this. And so if the camera is slightly below the horizon and is looking up, that means all you have to put is a card. You really don't need any kind of floor or any any support. It's on a conveyor belt, but you can't see the conveyor belt because the camera is the bottom of the edge of the camera is just tilted up enough. Yeah. And the key is just to have a nice background up there. And that's a super simple way to execute decent, you know, a decent strata cut. But they're actually at opposite. Like you have the clay coming at an up angle and the camera pointed at an opposite up angle. And then there's a conveyor belt that you're turning yeah. slowly right. it's the conveyor belt yes you you can use popsicle sticks you can use uh, chopsticks you can use um i used you know plexi pieces of the plexi lines of anything and you yeah. just run two pieces of tape along that uh all these little you know the railroad tracks if you will the tracks that you're putting down yeah but just imagine two pieces of masking tape and then you lay that on any surface and put some guide rails down which are simply you know a ruler can be a guide rail as long as there's a bump there the whole thing will slide really evenly oh. because it, it's just paper on paper it's just sliding because it has no the, the popsicle sticks and tape are sort of unified especially when you put a stratocut block on it that stuff isn't sh sh shifting around anymore it makes it very heavy and therefore stable and so when the conveyor belt goes forward um you're just chopping off the tape of each popsicle stick as it comes along <laughs> Oh, wow. You're taking it out. And that's happening literally right below the edge of camera. And then you're adding popsicle sticks on the end, at the back. Yeah. More right. tape. Oh, wow. I've never... And that helps with measurement and everything, too, I'm sure. Yeah. It, you still have to decide where your cut is. The key is to always know, oh, in this invisible... Th oh, sorry, in this space with nothing else in it, how do I decide where my pointer is? So I just decide the knife cut. And I use a plumb bob. Because the plumb bob you can take out of frame, but then I lay it, I let it, I let it drop in between frames, and that tells me where I want the knife cut each time. Wow! And so it's a consistent um, understanding of why each frame doesn't go backwards and forwards too much. You know, if you do it by hand and you're not looking, you're going to get more wavering and more other kinds of. Uh, yeah, yeah! Wow! Oh my! I'm goodness. glad you, I can see in your face, Terry. That it, this makes sense to you. So I'm oh yeah, it does. I'm actually uh, I'm actually thinking of projects where I could have used such a conveyor belt instead of uh, trying to jimmy rig something else. <laughs> but that makes so much sense because you can just chop off. It's like yeah. tape is super cheap and it's a huge long hundred feet, and, and you, uh, want... you can just keep taking off popsicle sticks, yeah. chopsticks, and that There's a more. I'm going to give you a level up design. So okay. take that as okay. a starting point. A simple way to make that better is um, to shoot down into a mirror. So put your camera up looking down. The Stratocut is here, and you get that you gain a double image, which I find very sexy. It's sort of like a mirror pond effect. If it's done, if it's cut up on a mirror, right? Yeah. And the and the loaf is going this way, but the camera's looking down, not this way, but just down at it, right? And it the mirror effect doubles the strata cut kind of like a you know what instagram does when you put like little i don't know blurry things top and bottom there's sort of yeah, a yeah. seductive hypnosis to that right there's some it's not just an artifact it's an intentional artifact to make you seduced your your outside retinas are being seduced on the top and bottom so you watch the focused middle um and having this mirror pond effect with the with the um if you add the conveyor belt coming across you can hide it underneath or, or you can let it be seen but the key is then to put a card up here so imagine the cameras this way bounces onto the mirror goes up to a card and just make it a really big card and you can put any beautiful color or shape and that becomes your background that makes sense and in sense yeah instead of putting the camera down here you just put it up there you added the mirror pond and you added another simple way and you can put a train car on that coming forever as well. 
Oh, wow. Um, nice. Have you yeah. just random question as I'm thinking, have you ever, uh, so once you slice off the strata cut, you can't use that slice anymore. Like, I'm just wondering why wouldn't, could you also take those slices and just, you know, plop a slice in a predetermined spot and take that out and then plop the next slice in and then you don't have to do conveyor no, belts? Because, right. It's a good question. No, the, it distorts when you cut those, the clay, it'll have a five to 10% distortion. Yeah. Because the friction of the, of the front slice gets, compresses it slightly as you cut it. That makes so sense. So it's never going to be repairably, uh, you can't put it back on. You you can, if you really want to by hand, sort of somehow even it back up all the way up. That sounds like crazy. So you redistort it the, wrong, the right way. Yeah. But then the registration is always weird. You know, registering um, Stratocut after the fact is a really impossibly difficult thing. So what do you do with all that clay? It just goes in the garbage or you remix uh, it no, into new um, colors? There's two or three purposes, actually. Uh, recently, you know, I've put a lot of these on Plexi and I'm trying to, you know, fund my ability to be a working artist uh, of selling, you know, objects of art that come from these strata cuts. Oh, wow. So that's, yeah, and I've saved a lot of slices, so I'm just trying to get them actually on. I Probably only a third of everything I made. I, I can't say I've slaved everything. Um, and yeah, this is a fairly, I wouldn't say, per, this is as permanent as any other art form, really, at that point, because... One, the, the beauty of a simple slice is that it makes clay, clay itself, which is the genre of clay animation, into the genre of Stratocut, which means you can actually preserve it. <clears throat> With clay animation, you really can never preserve your objects because as sculpts that are prone to dust dirt and distortion, everything gets nicked and cut and looks crappy pretty fast, even if it looked good under the animation foams. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not a preservable, but Stratica it is because of its thinness. The thinness adds a viscosity, I believe, to, uses the viscosity of the existing oil, wax, pigment, and um, calcium, calcium carbonate, you know, whatever the mixture that makes the clay. And it just sits there on the plex uh, with what I call liquid surface tension, much like the way water doesn't r roll right off of a countertop until it reaches a height and then it rolls off. Yeah, this is like really, really slow moving water or like really molten rock. It moves very slowly, but it sticks. And so it doesn't have the weight to pull it down. And so it's a preservable medium in my mind. And that's just the first thing I do with a slice. The second thing is I incorporate it into paintings. So what I find great about Stratocut is that you can make a small, it's easy enough if you can understand like a, a cone a cone is a geometry shape, and if you cut off the top of the tip all the way down, it's a dot becoming a circle. And if you can understand that, then you can make sort of a stratocut mouth and nose and eyes, and you just take the tube of what you're making as you do that. You just look right down at it and, and put the stuff in there. Uh, like Mia Fiore, by the way, Mia Fiore is, a, is like sushi. It's like a tube or a cane of, of design that's in a substance like clay. And you you slice it, but the goal of me of Fiori is for the pattern to look the same every time. It's just a literal extrusion in Z depth, right? And the difference is Stratocut is an intentional warping, distortion, and animation in Z depth. Um, so the I take these growing and shrinking faces. You know, you anybody can make a face in Stratocut that's fun and fun and uh, a monster, and take some texture. Look at some texture videos I have and build one, but only try to make the bottom of it look good. And then just simply extrude it up so it's really small at the top, right? So it all just pinches toward the top. Yeah. When you cut that away, it's just like explosive and it's toward a satisfying design. This is like one of the simplest Stratocut designs where people can successfully feel like, oh, I made that thing, right? Um, if you do that, you can repurpose all of those slices as dots, you know, small things uh, getting bigger and bigger, and you can actually see the morphology uh, of the entire piece if you just lay it onto glass yeah. or onto plex. That and makes it's a lot of sense. Kind of hypnotic and beautiful in its own thing. It's sort of a piece of, it's, it's oddly modern art. In, not modern art. It's really um, an expressive post-industrial art. Really. Totally. Um, it's a combination of sort of tribal 
uh, uh, prim prim primitiveness and technological um, uh, duplication. Because you're duplicating a lot of these things, right? There, there's an enormous amount of duplication. So I use those in these paintings. And then the last purpose, well, there's two other purposes. You can take any set of slices and slightly offset them a little bit at an angle. And when you put clay on an angle, that's the magic place. And you decide what angle to the camera you want that clay to be. And you can take one animation, put the slices back together at this new angle, cut it again, and you'll get a whole new animation that's actually um, really amazing looking. It's its huh. own, it's like, yeah, it's like watching the world through a blender, but all of the slices, all of the slivers make sense, like a like a really low res, um, low poly version of, I don't know. I, it, anyway, re repurposing it as textures is excellent like that. And, um, and yeah, the last point is just to uh, add it to future designs, right? There's yeah. A, yeah. Once the texture gets dense and worked, it's, it can be quite beautiful. And once it's cut up, great, it's still beautiful. And I put that as pieces in other future designs because that level of texturing takes work to do. And the fact you cut it up actually gives you an automatic uh, new level of uh, texture fun. That makes a lot of sense. I'm there trying to think is. of what other animation More technique you can literally things. take the same animation and, and run it again. And it's something completely different and interesting. Also, I'd love to go to a gallery someday and you walk in and it's just wall to wall, ceiling to floor, just strata cuts of like, like for instance, that 40 foot one, and you just kind of yeah. trail your eyes and look at the whole thing all at once instead of as a, as a oh. sequence. That would be super cool. I would have to build that again, right? Or build more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're talking about non, non cut up, I, that's a 10 years of work to try to fill a gallery. Yeah. Right. With. Um, but, have you ever used any other materials other than just clay? Uh, yeah, uh, of course, Fimo, um, Sculpey, they but, I mean, like, mean... for instance, like, um, I don't know if you consider the strata cut, but like, uh, I don't know if you've seen Kevin Perry's where he like cut up chocolates and fruits and like time lapse them. Would you consider yeah. that kind of strata cut too? Yeah, um, it is actually, but it's, um, you know, any, any way you cut up nature is fascinating. You know, you cut up a log, you cut up, uh, you, you think of a bulldozer plowing through the earth and yeah. doing it in a repetition at a very large scale, you would get an amazing strata cut from the um, striations in the Earth's rock. Um, I think that the MRIs, the MRIs that cut yeah. through fruit are brilliant, right? Because you see the stuff inside. The, really all I'm, when I talk about what I do, it's really about a language, a language of thinking, a way of perceiving, so you can create that. You're not, yeah taking what nature gave you, you're designing it and making it go somewhere as a character or as a, you know, piece of art that has a musical flow to it, or um, it's the human ability to conceive of something like that and create it that isn't actually from the vegetables or the beautiful bananas or the things. But yeah. there's the secrets. You look at that stuff and those are all the secrets of Stratica. You just have to design knowing Hey, this is how it looks, dude. So, a lot of this is on everybody who. This is mostly mental. You don't need a lot of clay to figure this out. You just have to keep asking this question a hundred times. It's like, oh, how did that happen in shape in time flow? If I were to shape the banana that somebody cut up, and I'm not sure if that was Kevin Perry, but I've seen a lot of these. And uh, why would I have designed that shape if I were doing it in clay? You know, sort of four-dimensional time flow represented in three-dimensional space, if you will. But again, it's time flow. And it's much like the Kurt Vonnegut character that we can't think of right now. Uh, it's the aliens that see in 4D. Um, you, you're building that part of the muscle, right, in your mind. And I don't think that's a muscle a lot of people use. So I think it's a, the art form is a gateway to thinking that way and understanding that way and learning that everything is contiguous and you have control over that continuity. You have control over, and it's like really fascinating aspects too, because you can have an animated blade. A lot of people don't consider that a flat blade is really limiting. Um, with with real Stratocut clay, I could probably do a bowed blade, 
And super, if I had a lot of technology, I could probably do corrugated blades, right? It would require a really sophisticated uh, alloy and, and machinery, machine shop to do stuff like that. But you could animate to a corrugated blade, right? Yeah. And this is why CG Stratocut is such an in, in, incredible thought, although inevitable, it's inevitable, that extrusions of human behavior and motion, which we're all fascinated by and we all look at all the time, but we can make those like the Kurt Vonnegut characters are seeing and then cut them away. But we use Booleans and um, we can make the cutter an animated piece itself. It can be a circle, a ball, it can be changing in any shape you want. Right. And then that gives you so much power that it's really up to you to decide how you want to, if you were to make that creatively, like in CG or as a, a re-photographing a real block and putting that into CG and adding the motion flow back into it, however you wanted to approach it. Um, I think that that uh, would be, you You know, my point is I just want to say that the, um, the angle at which you design the time flow of your sculpting, of your geometry, that angle can be any angle depending on how you want the knife to hit it. Everything you program is completely different looking if the knife is coming at it from a different angle and sometimes really beautiful coming at, at it from a different angle. Um, it's the nexus of those two things that is the design of the block. And I think yeah. that th that part of it's left behind. Everybody thinks it has to be a fucking knife. No. I love the it philosophy be... behind what you're doing. You could have just been like, oh yeah, I I, um, I cut clay, but no. <laughs> I, I love this. I actually, I actually just looked it up. It's uh, the alien race from Kurt Vonnegut is that I never knew how to pronounce this. Tralfamador. Tralfamadors from uh, from Slaughterhouse yeah. Five. That's where he yeah. talks about it. Tralfamador. Tralfam <clears throat> Tral Tral you're going to get, somebody's going to correct you in the notes today. I'm yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so, okay, so bring and me I back. I don't know which book that was from. Or he... <clears throat> it was from yeah. it was from Slaughterhouse Five. They, they live on the, some alien planet where they see in the fourth dimension. So, yeah. so bring me, so bring me back. You, um, Discover Stratocut, and you kind of you name it, you make it yeah. a thing. Uh, how did you yeah. originally come up with this idea to pursue I this? How been? Um, I started uh, sculpting at age five, mm -hmm. which is unusual <clears throat> because I never really stopped sculpting. And we, my sister Shelley, and my other sister Carrie had a table, uh, the dining room table set aside for play. And all we did was sculpt, you know, an hour a day or three hours a day or at night or whenever. And it's a lot like uh, a quilting bee. Um, it gave us the chance to develop whatever fantasy shapes we wanted to make in, in mirroring real life. It's like a lot of it is you're putting what's happening today into your clay, right? Uh, so at the age of eight, my sister Shelley, who is also a great artist, you can look her up, is um, sculpting a birthday cake because I had a birthday and she made this out of clay. She cut it open and then I realized, oh my God, it didn't disappear. It's pristine. It looks good. It's like magic. And the epiphany was very strong, but I knew that I didn't know what to do with it. I knew, oh shit, I'm eight years old. I have no idea what to do with that. Uh, and I just filed it away and never forgot it. It would just be one of these dreams that came back to me every few years or every six months. Or And I learned all of the other skills of filmmaking and animation and, and other traditional uh, arts to put it into motion. So it was really when I was 22, is that right? Something like that. And I sat down and said, this, is a, this can be a, it's not really a science, but this can be a language. It's going to be an understood uh, shape equals time over flow. And I sat there and just, you just cut it up, make notes, remember it, cut it up a different way, make notes, remember it. And then you start to understand the language by reverse engineering it, by just saying, oh, now if I twist it like this, what do I get? Um, just don't forget those things. It's just self-education of, you know, that. But cutting it up is such a refreshing, amazing joy that it's got its own satisfaction after a while. So... I thought, oh, what do I want to do with this? This is my first year of Cal Arts as a master's student. What do I want to do with it? And um, the fluidity of what it was telling me when I looked at how it moved was 
uh, I call it hypnotic and seductive. Um, it's also the morphic part of psychomorphic is the fact that all of the plasma mud, the neon plasma mud is moving in whatever direction you've designed it to be. It's not, it's not psychedelic in the sense of, um, uh, gosh, I don't want to get back into the Greek. That's really arcane, but <laughs> delic, uh, is logic, I think. And psychologic is what psychedelia is, but I think of it as a bunch of nouveau paintings from the twenties in Munka and a bunch of sixties posters, right. From, yeah. which are great, by the way, from the sixties, that's psychedelia. And so psychedelia has, um, that birthplace. And I think what I'm building is more tribal and strange. And so the morphic part of it is an important piece. Um, so, uh, you're at Cal Arts and you're, yeah, uh, you know, you right. have this... the medium is the message. And I thought, Oh, this is a fun house mirror on reality. I can actually make, um, uh, I can abuse, I can seduce and abuse. Like I want to make a film that's so difficult to watch, but you can't stop watching it. That was the yeah. objective of Buzzbox, right? How uh, much, how much fun can I hypnotize you and then also abuse you visually and then hypnotize you again and abuse you and hypnotize you? That was the push and pull and not go over the line of incoherence, not go over the line of chaos, not go over the line where your mind says, oh, I've had enough, I'm walking out. But you want to think about it. You know, the, the goal is, I want to think, I'm actually considering whether I want to watch the rest of this, this film. And the story is just information over, you know, media overload, disinfotainment really, I think is a better way to describe it where you're using entertainment both as consumer, um, you know, the practice of consumer behavior is so integrated with branding and the way um, images have a powerful impact on people and all the, you know, the way uh, audio and images work. And then the way we socially associate with influencers and celebrities and all of these other entities that float around in the circus of bullshit that we call, you know, social media now. Um, at the time, to me, disinfotainment was enough to be, uh, you have uh, hamburgers on one side and nuclear bombs on the other. You have seduction on one side and, you know, you have sex on one side and death on the other. And there's a reason why they throw all these, these things in a blender between banal everyday things that make you want to buy stuff and um, propaganda disguised as entertainment that's telling you, oh, and this is the way the world looks. This is the way the world should be. We're going to keep pounding at you until you're defenseless to absorb that unconsciously. And so that was the, the objective of Buzzbox in this medium, because it was so weird. It yeah. wasn't just a bunch of photographs. So it went past the filter of the audience. They didn't have to sit there and go, oh, I know what he's doing. I know what that is. I know all these things, right? When I look at these images, a bombardment of them is really easy to filter out because if it's really photographic, it's kind of like, yes, the brain is already a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the funhouse mirror of Buzzbox is actually there to bypass it because it's so warped and weird. It's seducing you to keep looking at it while it's trying to do all of these stop motion effects, which were uh, lots of cuts, lots of strobing, lots of other sorts of um, dramatic, uh, you know, things are melting and things are, you know, lights are going off everywhere. And then it pulls you back in with just the stratocut seduction part of it. And then it tries to, you know, offend you again, but not too much. Interesting. So, okay. So you make this yeah, as sorry, your... I didn't... That's, yeah, that's Cal Arts. And um, go ahead. Yeah. Re-ask the question. So, well, I'm just, you know, I'm curious, you make your film, uh, Buzzbox yeah. at Cal Arts. How do you go right. from that to, you know, getting picked up by Sesame Street or whatnot? Like, how did you exactly. actually turn this into a uh, uh, paid, like, how did, how did you convince people how to you pay you to make stuff after well, making this crazy film? Right. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it had a very strong audience of my own age and also a strong dislike. By so you, you published it and immediately you got reactions. I see. What, yes. Um, I would show it to get it. I showed it to get a job at Huey's Playhouse and I wanted to be an animator and um, the, there were, they were all filled up, but they, the camera, the director of photography, Daryl Studebaker saw my, saw Buzzbox and he said, 
God, you can run a camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wasn't looking at the animation. It's not about the politics. It's, not it's like, oh, you can press record. Great. Technique. It's just like, if you actually watch the camera work alone, and that's how I got my first gig. So there I learned much control. I did a lot of animation. I did the opening of Pee Wee, like the beaver design, yeah. the beaver and the monkey and these other things. If you ever watch it, these are nostalgic things. Um, and from that, I uh, was brought onto Peter Gabriel's Big Time, which is uh, 1980, 1980, oof, yeah, 1986 uh, in December. And then uh, from that, really the whole MTV thing, really it, 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 having such a strange medium worked in it for a very special six to 10 years in time. So, so but so but like, it. for instance, at Pee Wee's Playhouse, you're, you're not animating Stratacuts, you're animating the characters and then um, you're, are you in, you're still pushing for Stratacut. You're still showing people like, look at this thing I can do. Like how did, how did yeah, MTV, they, for instance, it, it, know you could do Stratacut when you were but, professional work right. or something else? Buzzbox got passed around. Gotcha. Just the very fact I was there, it got passed around. And so they knew, oh my God, we can uncork uh, a can of whoop bass uh, if we bring this guy into a rock, into a music video. And that's what big time I think succeeded at. But, um, it took, um, yes, yeah, so on Pee Wee's the first year in New York, um, I did like three penny episodes because the Ardmans had left. They they did the first nine. They established the style. And um, because I knew how to animate on glass so well, I knew how to do multi-level glass animation. They said, hey, don't do the camera work. Come over here and work on Penny. Uh, um, and then uh, they also had no animator for the opening. It's like everybody's moved working as fast as they can no animators are available and so they grab the only guy left and that's the only reason i worked on the opening and in an odd way you know that's fun because they don't have time to correct your beaver design and they don't have time to correct your monkeys or correct your bunny rabbits these are all things i just made at the moment because your the gun is so fast and so if you find that little opening that's all this is a little opening you just work your way into that it was the second season of Pee Wee where I did the Stratocut. So a lot of people okay. mix those two. I came back to LA from New York and shot um, uh, Christopher Columbus and um, and Fourth of July, um, which is you know Stratocut heavy. It's completely that. For fans of that work, if you ever look at it, I did the animation as well. I mean, I was still doing the stop motion side of it, which is all of the character animation. The, if you look at those pieces. I only showed the Stratocut part, but there's twice as much animation there, which I also was doing uh, to with this just straight up clay character animation. And it's reasonable. It's, it's pretty good. I throw some textures in, so it still looks Stratocutified. You know, the design work in the set, these sets that I built were still designed with that in mind. So if you could, if you so, could have okay. your way, you'd just be doing Stratocuts then for everything? <laughs> wow. Um, I learned a lot by not doing it. I mean, this mm. this went pretty well until, um, you know, I got picked up to do some crazy, uh, you know, commercials. There's a Honda commercial now on Instagram that got just went by, you know, been viral a couple of months ago. But, uh, you know, because it's a boring ass commercial, it's very postmodern that way. It's a boring ass commercial in the middle of it. Uh, this boring person just freaks out and starts screaming at the camera. And it's a Stratocut face. It's a it's a three dimensional David Daniel Stratocut, like hot potato of crazy coming out, and then it comes back in, and it ends on this very normal normal shot. And uh, those are the kinds of ways I was able to make a commercial using the technique and what I was known for, and that worked really fine. I also did the you know 1992. I did the freaked title sequence, which by the way is film. So that's a 24 frames a second thing. Um, much of the videos I did were either 30 frames, um, sometimes 24. Uh, Buzzbox, oddly enough, side note, is at 36 frames. It's at a very unusual frame rate, but there's a whole other story to that one. Generally, I try to work at film speed. It, they give you different effects. They give you your mind, is, the subconscious mind is attacked at different levels depending on yeah. the film speed, especially with Stratica, because you run any Stratocut, I dare you, at uh, 36 frames, then at 24, and then at 12. And I swear, you're going to have an entirely different experience at those different frame rates as to what you're looking at. And by that, I mean what the shapes you pull out 
what shapes you pull out from the same sequence. Yeah, that makes Just, sense because there's so much going on. It's it's hard to even like you don't even have time to to look right. at everything. So that makes sense. It's a Rorschach <clears throat> of your own mind. It's a it's Rorschach in your own mind. Your own, yeah. I mean, by that I mean your own um, multiple. You know, it's multiple pieces in your mind that are. Ha that's what's fun about it, right? It's yeah. going into the reptile brain through the eyes, through the all these cortexes, and that messaging can happen at different levels that you really can't control a lot uh just by film speed because there's no recognizable thing to hang on to meaning at live action you still get you still think the same way at 12 frames 24 and 36 even though you know hey one's a little keystone copy and the other's a little uh liquid or slow yeah but with with something that is not under or understood normally remember all the pixels are moving all at once that's another key aspect of this. All the pixels are moving everywhere all at once. Yeah. And the the retina can really only perceive that tiny little dot in front of us in focus, and everything else is sort of out of focus and happening. And so wherever you choose to look, you're still going to get this enormous, um, I don't know, mis mystery undulation in your eye that's sort of saying, you're in some other place. You know, you're, totally. this is not the way you're trained to look. And I, I never really thought about like I literally know. every pixel is moving. There's no background. There's no, there's no fixed assets. Um, okay. So, you know, Stratacut as a medium, it's not super popular. It is a, kind of a niche of stop motion. Why do you think right. it hasn't picked up uh, when it is, you know, it's super available to anybody, you know, you could just right. go and buy clay for cheap. Um, you don't need a lot of resources. Anybody can, it can add up. It can if you get it if you get ambitious, it can add up. It you get a forty foot uh, long yes. clay that adds up. But you know why? Do, why do you think it hasn't? Uh, like you don't see it in uh, like I guess modern stop motion uh, TV shows, films, commercials, except for like the, like you said the Honda commercial. Like here and there. Why do you think it hasn't picked up uh, as much? I, I think there's lots to say there. So. Let me not say just one thing about it, but um, <laughs> first, I don't. I stopped promoting it or making it in 2000, right? Yeah, and nobody, you don't see, there's, you don't really see anybody else kind of heading it up as a medium, do you? No, and I, that's actually changed a great deal, by the way. Um, I, I was unaware of who, there were certainly, there's lots of people who knew about, about it uh, through those, you know, from 80, 85 till 2000. Um, I went on to become a partner in a film production, animation, and special effects company, Bent Image Lab um, yeah. in Portland. And that took an enormous amount of my time. Um, you have to dedicate yourself to other talent. You have to work with, in a, you know, convention, a lot of different mediums that are not your native strata cut because um, it's hard to teach anybody. And you gotcha. can't do it on a production line level. It's just not part of its beauty is that it's a wild horse, right? It is not a thing that you can really ship off or uh, you, what you can get. What I would get is uh, what I call a sous chef. A sous chef is someone who's making the clay textures who can understand like a chef how to put all the slicing and dicing together that gives me the easy access to all of this intense kinetic uh, material. Um, so agencies could not understand what they were going to get, right? right? After a while, conservative, a conservative um, blanket, along with computer-generated images, came in the 90s where you, agencies really knew, oh, I should be able to pre-visualize this. I should be able to see this before I see it, right? I have a computer wireframe now. Can you imagine you making a pre-vis strata cut just to make the professional one later? <laughs> Oh my God! No, then they wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't understand whatever leap I was. If I'm giving them a thumbnail, they wouldn't even. Get yeah, it. I never thought of that. It's like, yeah, it's not very controllable. Like, so right. it sounds like uh, a combination of things. One is, you know, you stop marketing it as the the Stratica guy. Yeah. Right. Uh, two, uh, people totally. don't really know how to do it. Three, it's a really hard sell to. No, yeah, that's right. Don't know how to do it. And three, uh, the people with money for whatever. Um, eyeballs they're trying to buy you know whatever image yeah. uh, seduction they're trying to design right they're they're going to design it in a group in a consensus group 
by everybody agreeing every week, okay, this is the status of it. This is the yeah. thumbnail or the drawing. You can't have an animatic or storyboard or yeah, right. you can't you can't edit All it that beforehand. Stuff. It's super important for anything more than two people to actually all agree on something, and therefore, it automatically becomes an. You're only going to use it when you accept chaos, when you want something outrageous, when you understand that it's it, it's impact alone in at the hands of you know I can make any. I don't want to say I I can make most things that if I'm told what, what you know in my mind I can make most things. At some level, it's recognizable. I can make it coherent and recognizable, uh, but not in the speed, timing, and exact way that an audit, that an agency would want to see. Yeah. They don't know what they're getting. Can't, you know, what do you mean? I can't change it, right? And and therefore, it puts a damper on it. When you're doing I a strata cut, do you actually come out with an animatic? Because you you can time out things somewhat. Yeah. Uh, there's a a piece online I think regarding the Gary and Mike acid trip. I think it's uh, anatomy of a strata cut or um, some, I'm probably mistitling it, but it's a very good little three, four minute video that uh, shows uh, how the Gary, the, the acid trip part was built. And it's showing you sequences of um, where I had drawn out what action was going to happen and where I'm drawing the next one. So it was all keyframed on a timing sheet. So it's a, a long piece of paper. Every eighth of an inch is a frame, or in this case, a sixth of an inch, right? Because this is a really yeah. huge piece. This is like uh, tw nine by 12 inches, roughly. But um, And so every sixth of a frame. And then uh, all of the keyframes are timed out. So I'm watching on the thing where I want the hand to go. It's like, I want the hand to be here. I want the hand to be there. I want the hand to be there. Um, and that video is very good. So I just suggest that because if, it's hard, rather than me talk on and on about that. That's a really good one. And Go watch the video. Sure. <laughs> you watched it? Uh, I I might have. I'd have to I'd have to go in and see if I I'd have to watch it. And be like, oh right, I've watched this or not. I'm not yeah, sure. Well, if you find it, link it to the link. It yeah, yeah. I'll make a note for myself. Um, uh, but I do um, when I pre visualize. Yes, uh, I I think that it ranges from very heavy you know, very clear pre-visualization to very loose. Um, but the loose is always studied. I think of it more like a jazz musician is that you have a lot of modalities and things at your fingertips. And so what emotion are you trying to put across or what uh, what's the frame of the music you're making now? Yeah. And I go in with a lot of licks. So it's like, okay, I'm going to work on a spinning globe today or this week or this month. And I think I'm going to do that in front of an audience. It's going to take three hours. How do I do it? Well, you know, I build five of the six continents. I, you know, beforehand, I build a lot of these textures that are clouds and, and water. And I design those textures. And then I go in front of an audience and actually show the five, the five continents. And then I add Australia. I do the six because then they can see it happen. Yeah. And, and then um, I find that a really um, great way for people to grasp it so they wouldn't be afraid. I, I believe a lot of it, what I'm going to sum up is I, a lot of education happened, I think, in 2012, 2013, 2014. I went to Anima Mundi in Brazil, and they were very welcoming. You know, I got audiences of two or 250 people, and I was a featured speaker, and I was trying to explain, you know, give master classes in this in, uh, sub, in uh, Rio and later Sao Paulo. And even went back to Belo Horizonte, and there was that there's also a festival in Chile Monas. So during those three, those two years, I uh, did a lot of stereo videos. I did a lot of like how-to videos. I was trying to educate, and the best way was to take a stereo camera, shitty but still two slightly different images, and that way you can see in depth someday. Maybe YouTube with red and green glasses you can see today, but that sort of Stereo will be up to some AI understanding of depth someday. And that really worked to create all of these people who have self-educated how to do Stratica. Huh. And now I'm seeing, as opposed to what you think, which is very few people do it, I'm seeing an enormous amount of people do it. I, can't, I cannot believe it. My jaw drops when I see the new stuff that comes out of so many people who grasp, you know, they grasp 
one level of it or another and they're at different points uh but some of them are very very good and some of them take it farther than i would have in a certain way and i'm super thrilled that i can't believe what the i've discovered i don't know at least two dozen uh people who do it well enough to look at you know to say hey that's worth watching and probably hundreds of people who are you know working their way up on their first or second oh my gosh amazing that's really cool so okay so you know let me ask you this you know you've you kind of uh perfected the medium you've uh you know sold it to big companies you taught a lot about it and yeah. um, now you're trying to like turn some of it into art pieces. What's next for you with Strata Cuts itself? Wow. Like you mentioned you're so, you know you're funding yourself as an artist. Yeah. Is that to yeah. make a big Strata Cut thing? Uh, I would like to. It's like my ambition is still boundless in that regard. But uh, you have to think. You know, cut twice. I mean, I think. Measure twice, cut once. I'm doing a lot of thinking. Is this a strata cut pun? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a strata cut pun. Measure <clears throat> ten times and then cut once, uh, because you can't do it all. So when I I like to engage with other people who are somewhere getting better at it now, because I think that there's a lot of things I never did that I can tell them. Oh, try that. A lot of things. Um, I just couldn't do it all but they grasp it enough to do a lot of really interesting things that i think are only going to grow in how weird and wonderful they become so me sharing whatever like it's like notebook paper where i thought of it didn't have time but then i can see oh that person could actually do that and here i'm going to try to prod them or seduce them into actually trying that idea because i want to see it um so what was i saying just the, the community is immense I mean, it's still small, but it's it's actually quite dedicated um, in an, in a core that I would never have known, and the awareness of it is really really quite large. And again, small. I'm I'm really on the edge of that, but uh, significant. They're they're not they're like organic growth. They don't they they're not there for that moment and gone. It's really fun. Ah, awesome. I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, it's it's a growing thing and you're really excited about it. I'm wondering if somebody's listening and they want to uh, learn, try it for themselves, see right. like you, you do, you have been doing some workshops lately. Are you still doing those or is it more like um, publishing those online for other people to see or. Right. I, I want to do more, but not immediately. That was super exhausting. The summer I just went through has been an enormous amount of work, good work. A lot of it isn't even posted or shown yet. Um, so I look forward to revealing a lot of work that I was up to um, in, in an educational sense, meaning I'm showing how it, how it functions. The demos, which are sort of three or four hours long, uh, I was able to do many of those last month. I wanna do them again. I think I need a better, I don't know. A lot of it is just exhausting. And so it, it, it'll come down to I will do more of them, but money and time seems like the, the two things I want to try next currently is I, I've been thinking for several years about NFTs, like many people, and what the problems are and what could be done better about them. Um, and I'm not saying that I will, but, you know, you change your mind every day to the next thing. <laughs> I, I think I understand how I could make it. Uh, really unique value, something that isn't just a JPEG, something that is, it could be both physical, digital, where you own, like I could imagine doing two, two, two different versions of monkeys or chimps. Uh, one is sort of evil, evil chimps, and the other one is bonobos, you know, happy, blissful bonobos. And making 10 images in that loaf, in that block, and taking certain slices and giving everybody who buys, you know, one 10% of this, uh, of this, uh, it's not a JPEG, but you know, this motion picture, yeah. if you want to call yeah. it impact, uh, an actual physical, rep physical items that came from the actual cutting up of the block, and an opportunity to own 
their particular character out of that. So if there's right. 10 characters that I am, they're all morphing from one character to the next to the next. If there's 10 characters in there, uh, I would say, all right, you get as your NFT that frame, but you get five other angles of it. Uh, you get six other angles of it. That's what you own is actually a future proof way of having the sculptural uh, ability to see your strata cut from all viewpoints. Interesting. That's what you're buying. Not just a JPEG and not just a movie. Um, and also the physical items. If you want, you can have nine slices from it or some cycle. I can figure that out. A lot of digital, a lot of NFT people don't want anything physical. <laughs> some of them do, but many of them are pure, you know, digital asset and they crypto bros that have, you know, made their money there. And I don't know. I think that as a design thing, it'll be attractive because, you know, I'll figure that out. But what I've just described to you is what I call a grid camera. A grid camera is not a, uh, what is it? A, uh, it's not a um, light field camera. An older version of this would be called light field, which is a bunch, you know, 24 cameras all aimed to try to make you, give you all views. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, AI is d completely disruptive at this moment and we'll be able to take four views or six views or whatever smaller, much smaller amount of views and synthesize a, an eventual um, uh, viewing ability that the ego motion of your head, the viewpoint of your head, where you're actually looking and what is actually, is actually playing to you at that instant what the Stratocut is doing. It's playing <laughs> at any angle you wish it to see at. To me, oh, that's wow. not very far off. That's actually quite soon coming. I mean, uh, some, of this, enough, some of the AI, AI uh, stuff I already see looks like a like, like strata cuts, basically. Everything's well, nobody, moving. You're warping an image over time. Right, and... right. But I think that training AIs to really understand the data set of what it does is really good. I mean, it's not good or bad. It's going to happen. And I mean good in the sense that I would like to do it or have people who are love strategic do it and work mm -hmm. with them because i think it's a it's a genre it's a whole look it's a thing it is not just um my particular whatever it's it's got an entire um different way of behaving it has an entire different way of behaving uh make that a data set that the ai can understand and then output Yes, we're going to output uh, thousands of hours of Stratocut are going to be output based off of that. And it will be more defined, more than I could ever define it. Uh, and I, I'm excited by that. Yeah, uh, that sounds, but, I love that you're but, thinking about like all the different possibilities with what you can do with this medium. Like, uh, I think it's, I think it's super interesting. I'm wondering maybe as we're, we're wrapping up a little bit, uh, is there anything that you wanted to share that you kind of haven't said uh, for people listening and super curious and interested about this? you know, stop motion medium and maybe your career a little bit? Is there anything you wanted to share? Wow. Um, thanks for offering. Uh, of course. There's always so, well, I mean, there's always so much to say. So, yeah. this thing is, and I tend to ramble, I apologize. But, um, uh, well, I think if this is your, if your channel is about people who want to break into the business or, or into stop motion or into animation in general or into creative imagination at a yeah, in a larger yeah, yeah. context, right? Creative imagination, how can I become uh, useful to society that they will pay me to be creatively imaginative, right? What, well, what it, takes, my... it, takes, it also takes guts to pursue that thing that you believe in versus just uh, cookie cutter yourself into the industry, so. It does. You have to have a lot of self-understanding. A lot of people want to be cookie cutter. They want to go home and not have to think about it. They want their other life. They don't want, they want the nine to five to buy them uh, the freedom to enjoy whatever the hell they want when they clock, when they clock out. And that is not the, those who are willing to take the creative burden and say, all right, I'm going to do something that isn't cookie cutter. And I'm going to take the risk of failure, which is great and happens quite a lot. And yet, find a way to learn from that failure and pursue the next thing and the next thing, realizing in the long run, that'll be more satisfying. On the other hand, if you do get rejected, they're rejecting you because you're doing you, which is one of the most painful things, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing you and you get rejected, it's like, damn, that hurts. But if you're like at a job and they say, well, you don't do that job. Well, it's, you know, just a job. Uh, so I think the, 
entanglement with your ambition. You know, the entanglement with your ambition really drives you to do things that are uh, above and beyond. And I wouldn't have, I just, you must be ready for that if you really want to succeed or um, excel. Uh, I do think that going anti, uh, going away from what the market is doing is a good strategy if you feel you have an insight that no one sees. Fair. And you, you need to de-bias yourself about yourself, though. You need to know, first, what am I? Am I, am I into the cookie cutter or do I really have something people need and want to see? And am I any good at it? Um, and what would be the way I really, I don't want to say monetize, but make it into a working behavior that I like doing? That's hard to do. Because usually the things we love as we try to build them also became become the things we hate because we do it too much, right? There's a point at which, oh my God, not again. Or much of my life, I worry, will become just... Uh, bookkeeping and editing videos and figuring out how to, you know, yeah. show up on time for a podcast. I mean, <laughs> and, and that would be sad. Oh, no. I think it's super no. interesting that you still feel this way after having, you know, such a career in pursuing a very, very niche art form, yeah. um, which you have seen successes in. So I think that's super totally. interesting. And I really no, like it. I, I want you, everybody in your audience who sees this video to see themselves as a unique talent yeah. or somebody who doesn't really want to go into that arena and understand it and if you do have that be be fearless about going away from from uh, what the market similarity is and understand you're going to pay the price for that it's going to be a lot of hard work um and if you don't want hard work don't do it but um uh, the best thing is to know what it is you want to say how you want to say it where you want it seen why you want it seen why you want to get up every day and do it yeah. um, and how that aligns with your talents and abilities for people to actually want to say, Hey, here's, I like what your vision is. Here's uh, compensation or here's a way to make a living at it. Go for it, kid. That's the goal. And I, I think imagination is the greatest gift that any art form can express to any artist, right? The ability yeah. of another artist in the, in the biggest sense of the word, right? I don't mean it as a necessarily a fine artist, but anybody who makes art out of the moment of the process of their life, it's the broadest sense, right? I'm going to make art out of the process of every moment of my life. Um, there's no failing if that's what you're doing, right? You're not failing. And the chances of your success grow because you're enjoying it, which maybe I'm talking to myself because it's always a struggle because I'm always trying to understand how do I... Make I mean, you could be talking this. to yourself, but I'm also, you know, relating to it. It's gotten my, Good. it's getting my wheels turning about, you know, when's the last time yeah. I actually produced something of, uh, from my imagination art versus, you know, uh, yeah. kind of the nine to five job, which as is offers those freedoms that make life easier. They're not, <laughs> they're not to be, um, dismissed. They are super enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, you're at the end of it though. The last thing I would say is you're training your ability to think. At the end of it, your life just becomes your decision making. You're training your ability to think. And that's what your art is actually helping you do, even if you don't know it, even if you're trying to succeed at it as a as an ambition goal for monetary and for recognition. Uh, what you're doing in that process is simply, hey, I'm making a good decision or a bad decision or a like decision or not, or people appreciate it or they don't. And your ability to think, and I mean this in all circumstances and all parts of the life, is really the most valuable thing you have, isn't it? Yeah, yeah of course. 100%. And, and I don't see people focused on that. I actually don't understand. Because it's, it's why easier that to like, not to let somebody else think, you know, and just do, do, the, it do the work. It's really hard to There's think. There's a lot of lazy going on. <laughs> and that's if you're, if you're not lazy, that's your. That's your kryptonite. That's and your, you're cursed. Your <laughs> uh, you're cursed with thinking and being and working hard and taking risks. <laughs> yes, I don't know any other way to do it. Yeah, that's the only way. Yeah, uh, but for people who don't know whether that's good or not, uh, they're considering and thinking about it. It's really dig deep. Um, find something that takes you out of yourself. Find something that somehow realigns i don't want to say destroys your ego but realigns your ego so your ambition is actually driven by 
what you feel in your joyful heart that your life wants to be about. Yeah, um, I think that's that's the goal. So go out and do that. Yeah, and then you can come back and say, all right, this is the art I want to do, and this is how I'm going to make money at it. And all well, that. I think these are important thoughts, and I think you know, I think this is a great note to end on as well with the whole yeah. you know imagination, and I think that's super important as artists, especially in the stop motion world where it's not a cookie cutter job, and you kind of have to forge your way. Uh, right. You know, it's changing. It's changing now because there's so many productions going on. But uh, naturally, you know, I, I think stop motion artists specifically feel that a little bit more. So it, AI yeah. is going to hugely disrupt it, though. I mean, yeah. everybody at this moment, it's AI is going to disrupt it. But it's also going to be an enormous opportunity for stop motion, because uh, if you if you if what I describe as this grid camera or this uh, field array of four cameras or six cameras, can actually make a use augmented uh, sorry artificial intelligence to make a spatial understanding that's played to your eyes. Once that loop is complete, two years, four years, ten years from now, um, stop motion is on fire, right? Stop motion is take it's got jet packs uh, strapped to the sides and it's taking off yeah. because the ability to put texture on screen in stop motion is what its strength is, right? I'm getting super high def definition texture out of this photograph. And therefore, the puppet that's moving within it is um, um, uh, really fun to watch because I can feel he's physically vulnerable to his environment. He's not sort of abstracted like a 2D uh, animation. He's physically living in there. And that's why the high fidelity, the fidelity I'm talking about, this is like a giant new upgrade in fidelity. And that's why stop motion will thrive again. Every time you have that in 4K, back before that in hd in uh, video standard def and in, uh, super 8 you know super 8 is where i started and that's how a lot of stop motion older folks in stop motion began every piece you know every, every without that i would never have gone on to do any of this right so the technology had to exist at a consumer level and now the technology will be ai which uh helps you put your field array together so spatial stop motion and who isn't going to want to watch that but in and of itself it's going to be 10 more years and they'll be able to simulate it anyway. So it's right. this, I just think you look at the ebb and flow of the, how the technology affects your love for this medium and try to understand that. And then you have a better career path. Totally. I mean, that's, there's a lot to think about in, the, in those statements, but you know, we've, we've chatted about your career. We've chatted about yeah. Stratica, what it is, all the fun things you can do with it and where it's going. So David, Excellent. thank you so much for coming on the chat. It's been a pleasure. I'm super happy we connected. And it's nice to finally talk to you after seeing your work basically since I was born because you were doing stuff before I was born. <laughs> yeah, when did you first see something that I had done, by the way? Uh, I think, you know, probably when I was in like uh, 12 or 13 years old, I think, when, when YouTube was, was just probably... becoming a thing and uh, I was on all the stop motion forums and oh, okay. all that stuff. So. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad that it stood out to you and that oh, you now understand it better. And yeah, I've always, I don't know why I haven't tried it. I've, uh, cause like I, I started myself with clay, but I, you know what? I didn't have very much clay. I had, it's when right. I was making stuff, I had to re, I had to, I had to pick apart all Reuse the colors the of my characters yeah. to make a new character right. because I just didn't have any clay growing up. Isn't so. that 100% of it? That's mostly why. <laughs> Well, now, now as an adult, I could go to the dollar store and buy as much clay as I want. So we'll see. <laughs> okay. I hope that's true. Uh, it's wonderful to see the, the amount of people interested in it. But if you don't do it, it's fine. Um, it is, I don't know. There's some enjoy. It's very, uh, tell me after you do it, how it worked, like how you felt about it. Okay? Oh, the, if, when I try it, I will 100% get in touch with you, okay. I think. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll chat again. But, uh, you know, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. Thanks and if, to your audience. And bye-bye, yeah. everybody. <laughs> and if you're listening and you want to, you know, reach out or follow David's work, you can do so by checking out stratacut.com or check him out on Instagram, which is strata under, underscore cut. I'll include both those links in the description of this podcast. So thank you so much for listening. And that's all for now. Okay, bye. The music for this podcast was composed by Willem Mando and the graphics by Luhan Wang. I encourage you to look them up if you've enjoyed their work.